Well, welcome to uh, our 10th day together. Um, and uh, today, our theme is the law of mind action. And uh, our spiritual law, a direct quote, uh, is the way we choose the, to see the world creates the world we see. The way we choose to see the world creates the world we see. So um, that sentence itself may uh, lead some people to think that what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of magical thinking uh, uh, associated with some popular uh, uh, videos, movies, and books that seem to imply that if you just think positively, you can be wealthy, that it's just a matter of changing your thoughts and you can create the world of your dreams. Uh, the power of positive thinking. Um, and for many people, and rightfully so, this can be seen as just a form of magical thinking or perhaps superstitious thinking, that it's quite unrealistic. After all, the real world in which we live is a, is, can be pleasant enough, but it's also a hard and often unyielding place. And simply thinking uh, that good things for yourself uh, is not sufficient in itself to bring about the desired result that the old expression, um, if, uh, if, if people just wish they had a, ho a horse, they would, of course, everyone would be riding instead of actually uh, walking along who didn't have a vehicle. So wishing itself is impotent or a futile over against the hard realities of life. Yes, that's an understandable perspective. And certainly one might indeed go too far in the direction of overvaluing the power of the mind to change our reality. This is how uh, Sir John expresses the idea. Um, uh, I'll, I will paraphrase here. Sir John uh, Templeton sees thoughts as having a force in our lives that is no less real than the force of our will and the force of external physically, physical objects. Actually, it's his view that thought, thoughts are, are more powerful than external physical f forces because if we change our thoughts, he thinks, we can change what we want and change what we experience in our lives. And the, the principle that, uh, the practical principle, again, I haven't said it in a while, but Sir John does seem to have been a, a very practical, a mystic, uh, a kind of saint of the practical life. And he, he advises uh, that if we want to change our reality, then we need to change our thoughts. And we do that by change, by shepherding our thoughts, by guarding our thoughts, by a careful process of refining our thoughts. I mentioned this uh, in an earlier uh, video, uh, this process of sifting and sorting uh, so that we can uh, sort out the unhelpful ways of thinking. Um, and so this is essential, this notion of shepherding your thoughts um, so that you can choose or select from them thoughts that are helpful, thoughts that are beneficial, thoughts that are likely to make your external reality better. Think about it like this. If, you're ex if you could make it so that your external world actually mirrored your thought world, what would that external world look like? Think about the quality of your mental world, and I will try not to make it so personal, I can direct it to myself. If I look at the quality of my mental world, I actually will probably discover that to some degree it is reflected externally. And if I begin to change the contour and shape and tenor of my thoughts, it's quite possible that, uh, that actually, as a, a great philosopher said, that the world of a happy person is a happy place. And the world, this, to go on, uh, to, to extend that, the world of an unhappy person is an unhappy place. Now, I know that that can lend itself to a lot of skeptical responses, and so um, we'll try to probe this idea a little bit more in light of some of the sources and other sources uh, that can perhaps make this idea about uh, the law of mind action more plausible. Now, if you think that you hear the influence of the New Thought movement of 19th century American spirituality, you're right. Sir John was 
deeply shaped by the Unity School of Christianity uh, early in life through his mother's influence and then later in life because of his own interests and involvements and grants. So un Unity is similar in some respects to Christian science. Um, they're quite different in many ways, but fundamentally they are part of what William James referred to as the mind cure that became quite popular in the 19th, early to middle 19th century. Uh, many forms of mental healing were, there, were then developed at that point, um, and the, the so-called mind cure uh, ha was the beginning of the recognition that actually our minds are a causal factor in our physical experience. This today in 2018 is not as dramatically um, radical an idea as it, sir, as it was a century ago. The idea in, our, in a world dominated by a kind of raw materialism, and I like to say materialism just isn't what it used to be ever since the, the, uh, the, the Einsteinian uh, revolution in physics and the new physics, which is now the old physics, began to emerge. Matter just isn't what it used to be. And this was sort of perhaps the beginning of the recognition that old-fashioned matter, the kind of Newtonian matter, was beginning to dissolve in a kind of uh, quantum fog of indeterminacy. And so the law of mind action uh, begins uh, in the mind cure movement of, uh, of mental healers that became quite popular beginning in the middle of the 1900s. This eventually gave—that's the name William James, the great psychologist and philosopher, gave to this. And of course, eventually that gave rise to such movements as uh, positive thinking of Norman Vincent Peale. Uh, and um, this law of mind action, the phrase probably comes from the Unity School of Christianity. Christianity, I would suspect that's where it comes from, especially since uh, Sir John quotes a unity source when he refers to it. But unity itself says that the law, it, the law of mind action can be stated this way. Human beings create their experiences by the activity of their thinking. Everything in the manifest realm has its beginnings in thought. That's the unity way of expressing this. So we have that background. But another background is, of is the doctrine of karma or karma in, in Indian philosophies. The idea of karma is a pan-Indic uh, uh, notion that all traditional Indian religions share. The idea of karma is that what goes around comes around, but not only in this life, but in, in, in lives to come. Um, this notion of karma that we have today is very complex, there's a long history to it, but one of the great figures in the Upanishads, he, he, he exclaimed, a person turns into something good by good action and into something bad by bad action. And the Buddha, uh, a little bit later, he gave an ethical turn to the notion of karma by noting that, uh, he says, monks, it is volition that I call karma. For having willed, volition, one then acts by body, speech, and mind. So the, Buddha's, the Buddha made this link. He called willing karma, by, because what we will is what we become. All right, so those are some of the spiritual or religious background. But why is this idea not as implausible today as it may have formerly been? It's because matter just isn't what it used to be. Yes, that's true. But it's also because of the science of stress that began to emerge in the 1950s when a Dr. Hans Asselle uh, uh, published a book called The Stress of Life. And it may seem odd now, but the idea that, that a mental factor like stress could have such a, an impact upon our bodies was a radically new idea in those days. There was no field in those days called psychoneuroimmunology. But uh, and which is the idea that uh, that what we think has an effect upon our immune system. This would have probably have been thought of as what sometimes people refer to as a woo-woo idea. Well, this woo-woo idea is very mainstream now because by becoming mindful, as in mindfulness meditation training, of the stressors uh, that create measurable physical, deleterious physical outcomes, we can begin to moderate the influence of stress in our life. Or, as recent studies of stress show, we can begin to make use of stress in a positive way as well. But it's, it's our mind. It's our volition. It's how we respond to the stressors in our lives, how we think about them, that can have a great impact upon our health. 
One of the most important health a medical bestsellers, maybe the first great medical blockbuster of the late 20th century was uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, Herbert Benson of Harvard Medical School, his book called The Relaxation Response, which appeared in 1975. Dr. Benson was trying to figure out a way to reduce the incidence of hypertension in his patients. And, um, and as a result of the study of meditation, which was a revolutionary idea at the time, uh, he slowly, he, he, he became to the conclusion that when the mind is focused, perhaps through meditation, the body responds with a dramatic decrease in heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure if it was elevated to begin with, and metabolic rate. This he referred to as the relaxation response, which is the exact opposite of the fight-or-flight stress response. And so, um, as a consequence of that discovery, he described uh, meditation as being able to induce a physiological state of quietude, which can counteract the physiological consequences of, 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 the, of the stress response, of the, uh, of the fight and flight response. So, at any rate, the whole idea, then, of the law of mind action is not as uh, exotic today as it formerly was.